my name is Kara Starowski, and my breed is the Boceron. I've had Bosserons for 15 years, and I'm currently serving as the American Boceron Club's president and rescue chairperson. Well, I um, grew up, you know, we, we had pet dogs when I was a kid. Uh, we had Roddy's and Bernice Mountain Dogs. Um, and I really, really loved the look of the Bosron. I was 14 years old when I started looking at them. And I wanted a dog for junior handling that was, you know, sharp looking and attention getting, uh, but still was intelligent that I could try other sports like agility with. Um, and Bosron just fit that bill. Plus, there was something that was just a little different, a little unique. And I got my first BOCE when I was 15. Sure, well, actually, um, before I did any AKC or UKC showing, I actually started with my local 4-H program. Um, I was really lucky because I don't come from a dog show family. My family loves dogs, but they weren't dog show people. Um, and it's really hard for uh, young people to get their foot in the door with AKC if they don't have a mentor or you know somebody guiding them. So I was really lucky that my local 4-H program had an excellent dog program. Um, the kids all have to learn junior handling and, and obedience and dog knowledge with, with their dogs. And so that's where I started. Wow. Um, so long before I began um, showing myself, I mean, I watched the Westminster Dog Show on TV. Like it was the one school night of the year my parents let me stay up late just so I could watch the finale for Westminster. And I had... Um, decided then that I, I wanted a show dog. I wanted a dog I could show and compete with. Um, and through the 4-H program, um, a woman named Carol LeBlanc, who was our, our local, one of our local 4-H leaders, um, and uh, you know other people as well too. And certainly as I got my Boceron, the Boceron community helped me as well, people who had been in the breed longer than I. Um, so there's, there's a lot of people. It takes, you know, what they say, it takes a village. Mm-hmm. So the Bosun, um, a lot of people see them and they think they're a new breed or they want to know are they a mix of like a Dobie and a Roddy or a Shepherd and a, and a Roddy. Um, but they are their own breed. They're a very old breed that's native to France. And they actually have no foreign crosses, meaning that the Bosun was developed from local farm dogs and that's it. In France, they were used um, as a living fence. So in the pastoral regions of France, France where they're from, it was very hard to set up permanent fencing, either because it, they, they were grazing livestock on hilly mountainsides, so it, it was hard to set up any permanent fencing, so they used the dogs. The dogs would work around the flock, keeping them in whatever pasture they were supposed to be in, whatever path they were supposed to be on. So they are, first and foremost, a herding breed. Um, so with the introduction of um, electric fencing, electric like um, netting, netted fencing, um, the dog's job in Europe as a herding dog is almost obsolete. There's still some tough old farmers who use them um, because they're stuck in their ways or they're proud of their dogs. Um, so more modern functions for them. We do see them used a little bit in police and military work, particularly in Europe, not so much here. Um, but a lot of people who enjoy doing dog sports love having a bus run because they do have some versatility. So if you like to do, you know, a little bit of agility, a little bit of dock diving, a little bit of nose work, they can do all that stuff. Right. <clears throat> and have you seen them um, used for any, uh, like, personal protection or guardian work? I have seen them um, used, uh, you know, sometimes people train them a little bit for ring sports or what used to be IPO, but it's now I, IGA. Um, the problem with the Bostron is that they're very slow to mature. So you really, like, you can start working a Malinois a year, 16 months. Bostron, you need to wait till they're two, if not older, before you really start serious work with them. And they're very in tune with their handler. This can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing that makes them unique to train. If you are frustrated with them, they will pick right up on that and shut down. They won't want to continue working with you. Um, the other problem is they can be very defensive with their handler. So if your decoy or helper is not used to working a Bosron, um, you can have a dog who goes from a good working dog to a dog who's just defensive all the time. 
and really is, is not safe to be around and not safe to trial. Um, so if you if somebody's thinking of working a bow run in a protection sport, they have to be really experienced. And you really, you have to love the breed, not so much as the sport. Um, when I had the opportunity to go to the Bostron National Specialty in their native land in France, there were um, over 500 dogs entered in the show. And of that, only there were only six Bostrons competing in uh, French ring in, in the bite work portion over there. So that really tells you that it's... Um, you can do it with them, but they're not ideally suited, right. if that makes sense. Uh, do you see that they do have natural guarding, uh, guardian uh, instincts as far as, like, your property and... and... Oh, absolutely. You, and you don't need to encourage it. It is there. They will let you know when somebody's here. And just their size is enough that, you know, I always feel safe when I have my dogs. Just their size alone is enough to make people move away from them. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. They let you know when somebody's here, and I i don't think a stranger would ever walk into a Bosron's house. Right. Uh, talking about size, could you tell us the, uh, the AKC standards and the FCI, and is there a difference between the two? So when the Bosron Club was... Um, trying to make the breed AKC, and we had to come up with the breed standard. One of the most important things was that we really, really tried to stick to the French standard. We tried very hard not to change anything. You know, sometimes when breeds get accepted into AKC, stuff will get changed or altered. So we tried really, really hard not to deviate from the French standard. Um, but so the Bosron doesn't have a specific weight requirement, but I average the males are about 90 pounds, 90, 95. Females are a little less at 80, 85. Um, we do have a height requirement that actually it's a disqualification. Um, the males can't go over 27 and a half inches at the shoulders. And the judges actually, they can measure them. They can use a wicket and measure them. Um, and in France, all the dogs have to be measured. Like, even if they look like they're perfectly within size, they still measure not only their height, but they measure the, um, they take skull measurements. Um, and they, so the boys have to be 27 and a half, 25 and a half to 27 and a half inches at their shoulder. And the gals have to be 24 to 26 and a half inches at the shoulder. And anything above or under that is a disqualification. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, the, the color? What are the, the colors and what are the disqualifying colors? Sure. So there's, the Bosron is recognized in two colors. We have the, uh, I don't want to call it more traditional, but the more common variety, uh, what we call the black and red, or the French call noir et few, black and fire. And so it's a black dog with markings on their face. They should have the red stockings. Uh, they have little markings on their butt. It's adorable. <laughs> and the, Har the Harlequin Bosron, the rest of the dog community would call it Merle. Um, but at following French standard, we refer to it as Harlequin. Um, it's still a black and tan dog underneath, but it has gray splotches that should be evenly distributed throughout the body. The interesting thing about the Harlequin Bosron is as puppies and as you know, young teenagers, their color is so vibrant. It's, it's breathtaking and then as they get older they fade and some of them by mid you know by middle age almost look like dusty black and tans because the color really has faded that much uh, we don't know why this happens and a couple breeders here in the u.s have recently started um doing some genetic testing with companies like remodia who study the moral gene to try to figure out why that happens because it certainly is a unique thing to the bosron to have that dramatic of a color change. Actually, one of the pictures I sent you was a side-by-side -side of a young puppy and then pictured again at, so pictured at four months and then at four years. And, you, and she actually held her color pretty well. I don't remember if you remember seeing that yeah. one, but what, what a dramatic change. Definitely. And I have seen some that are even more, the dogs really look black and tan. You really got to look to see where that gray is. 
They shouldn't have, they, ideally they don't have any white on them at all. A small white spot on the chest is permissible, um, but really you don't want that. Mm -hmm. yeah, th those are the only two colors. Historically, um, the Boceron did come in a red, like the Doberman, and a blue, like the Doberman. Um, and every once in a while, we see those colors pop up just from time to time, just like sometimes red Rottweilers happen. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Every once in a while, we see those, but those are, you know, pet old, you know, just pets. They can't be shown. Mm -hmm. UKC shows, um, they acknowledge the Boceron, um, and, you know, of course, FCI, and, you know, and the Boceron has been AKC since 2007. Mm -hmm. They are. They prefer cold weather. They are a cold weather dog. They, you know, that nice. They have a much thicker coat than like a Doberman, um, so it does keep them well insulated. But I mean, they are adaptable. I know plenty of Boserons who do just fine down in Florida and Texas. Mm -hmm. So they are adaptable. So, uh, like, like most herding breeds, there is always going to be that desire to chase. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, up to the, to the owner to kind of guide the dog that, no, we don't chase the kitties. No, we don't, you know, bother the small dogs. So, I'm a groomer, and my dogs occasionally come to work with me, and they all know we don't bother the little dogs when they're getting groomed. We have barn cats, and they don't chase them. Um, but I know that if, if, they, if the dog doesn't have guidance, yes, they will chase cats. They will chase chickens. They need that guidance. Right. So we don't, you know, like certain breeds, like the Doberman, for example, is notorious for same-sex aggression issues. We don't see that as much in the Boceron. Um, you know, I know plenty of people who have harmonious households with same-gender dogs. Um the males can be a little bit bossy with each other, a little bit grumbly, some posturing, um, but it's it's unusual for a Boceron to be very dog aggressive. It's it's pretty uncommon. Uh, tell us about your your recent experience there in New York. What was that like? Oh sure. So like I was saying, um, as a kid, I stayed up and I watched Westminster, and I wanted to show there so badly. Um, and my first two Boserons um, were, were more pet quality, so they were not uh, Westminster material. And then I finally got a little female who is just she's a really wonderful little dog. Um, I enjoy showing her so much, and so we showed in Westminster in New York City for the first time last year and it was quite the experience it really it's um so different than any other dog show Westminster is a bench show meaning you have to stay there during these show hours so the public can come see your dog and showing in in the Westminster ring and even we're not even talking about the group rings you see on TV we're talking about the small rings where they do the individual breed judging it's so different than any other dog show I mean I'm a pretty experienced exhibitor not much rattles me but I was nervous walking into that show ring because um, when you're on the uh, inside looking out it's just a sea of people and everybody has their phones and their cameras and they're videotaping and recording you and you know the flashes from all angles there's a loudspeaker right over your head like you can't even hear yourself think um there's guys with the professional camera equipment at each corner of the ring i mean these cameras are huge uh, totally like <laughs> it's it was really i was nervous going in that ring um but once we started showing we hit our routine we did fine we were not the winners but i was so happy just to be there so it was it was quite the experience UKC does. It's called um, Premier, uh, which it's held, I believe, out in Michigan every year. Um, and they invite the top 10 from each of the breeds to go and compete. Uh, I have never gone out there and competed. Um, Michigan's a long drive yeah. <laughs> from Connecticut. Um, but I know a lot of people go and enjoy it every year. Um, UKC showing is a lot of fun. It's... Um, you can only show your own dog. So in AKC, uh, you can pay a handler to show your dog for you. And in UKC, they don't allow that. A handler can show their own dog, um, but you can't be paid to show someone else's dog. So it's a little bit more of a level playing field, a lot of people think. So I always enjoy the UKC shows as well. Um, UKC is really for the working man's dog. 
They promote a lot more hunting events for coonhounds and beagles. Um, they do not allow any product in the dogs. So, like, when you go there and you look at the poodles, the styling of them is so different than what you're used to for AKC because they do not allow hairspray. Um, so, poodles don't have to be in the... Um, traditional continental or English saddle clips that you're used to seeing. Mm -hmm. um, they, I think, I don't have a poodle, so if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, I think they just have to have an inch of hair so the judge can make sure the dog has the correct hair texture. Um, but yet, no product, so you're not going to see dogs with that flat iron hair that you, like, you see, like Yorkies, where that hair is like pinned straight because there's no product allowed. Talk about your uh, morning in... Uh evening routine with your dogs what do you uh what do you what does that look like <laughs> for, so for the bow strong it's all about they want to run around uh, we have a small farm mm -hmm. so the dogs just um you let them out in the morning and you look out the window and they are just doing laps on their own up in the horse pasture because that is what a bow strong wants to do they want to run and run and run they have an incredible amount of energy mm-hmm what uh, what kind of kennel setup do you have? Do you are they do they stay in your house or? So I only have um, three bow runs, uh, only, you know, only. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's tough like three hundred pounds of dog, but only three. Um, so mine live in my house, and they do love their people. So they're not ideally suited for um, you know being away from them all the time. Mm -hmm. Not to say that uh, you know we do have a. a fenced in kennel area in the backyard so if my husband and I are both working a long day and it's nice weather they will be out, out there um, but the majority of their life is on the couch well our car previous conversation you were talking about you're gonna you, you're possibly gonna have your uh, first uh, litter yes yes um, so uh, my youngest she's three now she completed all of her health testing so for the Bostron um, the Bostron Club Code of Ethics um, and our the, K, the OFA, so the canine, um, the chick numbers, requires that Bostrons have their elbows, hips, eyes, and heart examined for genetic problems. So Mahalo recently just passed all of those. So I went to France to scout out um, a potential stud dog for her, and I found a couple dogs that I really, really liked. So, crossing my fingers that this, um, going with her, he cycles, that we will have our first post round litter uh, this December, or well, that was when she'll be bred. Mm -hmm. uh, so, puppies in February, and I'll get to enjoy having adorable puppies in the nice warm spring weather of April. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Sam, I'm breeding for myself. I would like a puppy from her. Yeah. She's such a nice little dog, so yes. Right. So I'm a huge supporter of the phrase, feed the dog that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of going on the idea that every dog is different, every dog's needs are different, so you really need to do what's best for them. Um, I, since I, my, the first breeder that I purchased my Bosron from, again, 15 years ago, um, really encouraged a raw diet. And that's what I have fed to all of my dogs ever since then, and I've never looked back. So that is what I like to feed. I make it myself a, a blend of meat, bone, organ, small amount of vegetables, small amount of dairy, very small. Like I'm talking like a spoonful of yogurt a couple times a week, mm -hmm. mostly just because one of the dogs really likes it. Um, but I've been comfortably making my own dog food that way for, again, for 15 years. But I understand it's not for everybody, you know, people who, you know, don't have the time for it. And trying to buy this stuff that's pre-made is very expensive for a big dog. Um, and I know plenty of restaurants who do just fine on a kibble diet. So it's, again, big supporter of feed the dog in front of you. Um, so as far as large dogs go, most ones are pretty healthy. And they have decent longevity for the size dog that they are. Uh, but certainly things to be aware of are hip and elbow dysplasia in the breed. Eye issues, we're seeing uh, more and more dogs with entropion. So that's something certainly to be aware of. 
Um, and, you know, the, the biggest heartbreak in the breed is the dilated cardiomyopathy, which any Doberman owner will tell you is absolutely horrific. Uh, my first Bostron uh, died of DCM, and it's when the heart enlarges. And it's really, it's a, it's a very hard way to, to lose your dog. Because, um, like, um, I grew up with Bernice Mountain Dogs who tend to get cancer. Mm-hmm. And when a dog gets cancer, you can tell they're tired. Their bodies are tired. It's I don't want to say that it's easy to to put them to sleep, but the, the dogs are ready. The dogs are hurting. The dogs are in pain. The trouble with DCM is their brains and minds stay alert right in until the very end, it's just their bodies fail them. They can't get up. They can't do the things that they used to do. Um, my old man, um, when I would like pick up the dog show bag, he wanted to go. He knew exactly what that dog show bag was. He, he couldn't understand at all why he couldn't go with me anymore. Um, so, but he was almost at a point where he was, he couldn't do stairs anymore. Um, and he really, he was struggling just to, to stand it. He'd like get stuck in his crate. We'd have to take the crate apart to help him out of it. So that's why DCM is hard because the dog's brain is, is active and as alert as ever. Just the bodies fail them. Mm-hmm. Um, the other uh, OCD, which is a problem with shoulders, we're seeing more of that. Um, but those are the biggest, biggest concerns. Certainly, I think DCM is the biggest thing threatening the breed and to be aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, so the American Bostron Club is the parent club here in the United States, states which means that it's the uh, AKC's affiliate club for the Bostron. Um, the Bostron Club's first, most important job is they maintain the breed standard here in the United States. So they work with AKC to drive that written standard for what a perfect or what an ideal Bostron should be. Um, and only the parent club can make changes in that. Like, you know, say we suddenly decided we wanted to allow the blue and red Bostron, um, it would be decided by the parent club. Um, their other jobs is they run the Breeders' Code of Ethics, so a responsible breeder will follow those, follow the uh, importance of health testing, breeding dogs only with good temperament, and selling only to responsible puppy buyers, never selling to pet stores or brokers or anything like that. Um, the Bostron Club also maintains uh, the breed rescue. So another really, really important thing. And, of course, they host Bostron events like the National Specialty or Supported Entries, things like that for people to show. Mm-hmm. I have, um, I was the club's first junior member. Um, and about six years ago, I started volunteering more, and I, was, I volunteered to run the rescue. So I became the rescue chairperson. Um, and then I served as vice president for two years. And then I'm in the middle of a two-year term as president. And I'm still serving as rescue chair. And I'm our judge's education chairperson. So I wear a lot of hats. Mm-hmm. How do you um, hold uh, the breeders accountable? Do you guys um, have a database where they have to prove they're health tested and all that? or? So we, um, when a when a breeder or anybody joins the club, um, they agree to abide by the code of ethics. Um, if they are found to be breaking the code of ethics, we actually have to have a hearing, um, and it's uh, the disciplinary process. Um, it, you know, we we are presented with evidence saying that okay, you know, this person bred a dog who is known to have a bad temperament. So the board of directors has to look at that and make sure that there's sufficient proof that, that yes, that really happens. The breeder is given a chance to respond um, and see, you know, was it a misunderstanding or are they really doing something wrong? And then we proceed from there. So that's. That's kind of a, you know, certainly it's a difficult topic to do things like that because many of these people, breeders have known each other for years, many are friends, but the Bostron comes first. The, the health of the dog and the dogs that they're breeding and the temperaments, that all comes first. So there, it sounds like you guys are taking measures to not let 
the show quality dog uh, take over the the capable working dog. Am I correct in my assertion? You are a hundred percent correct. Mm. The Beauceron, first and foremost, is a herding dog. Um, so that's why we are strongly discouraging. You know, we've seen some really big males. If you see my boy Jackal. Um, he's a big dog. He's a very large male. He's as big as they ever should be. Um, but he really, he's, he's too big to do his job. He could not go herd a flock of sheep all day. He's just, he's too large. He would be worn out, you know, partway through the day. So we really, really are, are emphasizing that breeders, we're looking for moderate dogs. It, it isn't, you know, the biggest is not the best when it comes to the Boceron. They should be, a, they're a large dog, but they should be a moderate dog in all proportions. And yes, we, you know, form should absolutely follow function. That's why there's nothing really extreme about the Boceron. They're not super big. They're not super small. They don't have super short noses. They don't have super long noses. Everything about them is just moderate. Mm -hmm. And that's even, you know, one of the things that, being involved with the judges' education committee, one of the things we emphasize is even in a showing, the Beauceron shouldn't be trimmed. They're supposed to be presented natural and rustic. That means we're not supposed to be shaving whiskers. We're not supposed to be trimming ears. A, a good Beauceron doesn't need that. Um, over in France, <laughs> the groomer in me was a little horrified. They presented dogs who were dusty and dirty to the judges, and the judges did not seem to mind one bit. I feel like if we tried to do that in the AKC ring, we might get, we'd get laughed at. But yeah. you know, they're, they're a rustic dog, and they should be. Right. Luckily, the, really, not too much. Not compared to, you know, you mentioned you know, bulldogs, and you look at pictures from the bulldogs, you know, even not even 100 years ago, even 70 years ago. Look how much the bulldog has changed. Bostron really is not a lot different. We're seeing again, not just and not just here in the United States too. Also over in France, you hear comments quite regularly that the dogs are becoming too big, they're too heavy, too much bone, um, and not that you know substance is a good thing, but they shouldn't be overdone. They shouldn't be that large. So other than that, really, they've changed. Very little, very little. We see more harlequins than we used to. Um, that's the moral coloring again, but there's nothing wrong with that. I think we're just a lot of people who have the Boceron as a pet. They're attracted to the color, so we are seeing more harlequins than we used to, for sure. Right. Yes, and that's the, the good breeders will always tell, remind their puppy owners or puppy buyers that the color does not stay. Right. Yep, so we, um, I've never... I have helped Canadian rescues, but our primary focus is dogs in the United States. Um, luckily, we're not needed very often. We have become increasingly busier in the past couple of years, unfortunately. But that's what we're here for. That's what the club is here for, to protect the breed. So we have a nationwide network of fosters. And so people from all over the country... Uh, have volunteered their hearts and their homes to fostering a BOCI. So if a dog shows up in a shelter, you know, out in California, that's okay. I've got contacts out there, even though I'm from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, we take dogs from private owners. The number one reason that Boceron's are surrendered to us is because they are too active. Mm -hmm. People don't realize how high their energy level is and how much they need an outlet. Um, we have pulled dogs from shelters. Uh, I had a really, really pretty dog. Um, he was emailed to me from a friend who rescues Dobermans, and he was in a local shelter, and he was listed as a Doberman. So I asked the shelter to send more pictures, but the dog had no dew claws, which the Boson is known for their double dew claws, but he really looked like one. So I asked if a volunteer could go evaluate him, and she did, and she's like, I really think he looks like a Bostron, too, and we got the information from the shelter, and the shelter explained that the dog had belonged to a trucker, and the guy, uh, his truck got repossessed, so he was homeless, he surrendered the dog, he had purchased the dog from someone who told him it was a Doberman Great Dane mix, so he had the dog for a couple of years, 
Well, long story short, the foster home got the dog home, and he was a sweetie, and he rolled over on his back for a belly rub, and he had a tattoo on his thigh, which some breeders, instead of using microchips, they tattooed the dogs in the thigh or the ear Mm -hmm. as a permanent means of identification. So we were actually able to get this guy safely back to his breeder, and she was able to find him a good home. But it's just, it's crazy that somewhere along the lines, his dew claws were removed, and, you know, the guy didn't even know what kind of dog he had. Outside of uh, France, where is the largest uh, Beauceron population? That's a good question. Um, I mean, we do have a lot of them here in the United States. There's a lot of um, them in the Czech Republic. We see a lot of Beaucerons coming also out of Belgium. Um, hmm. As I would say, you know, the U.S. has quite a few and the, and the Czech has quite a few. I mean, they're scattered throughout Europe, though, certainly. Um, I mean, we, we have them all over, but certainly there's a more Boces out on the West Coast. The, uh, I'll fondly refer to her as the grandmother of our breed. Carla Davis has, is the longest, longest running breeder in the United States, and she's out in California. So naturally, there's a lot more out there because um, she's been, been breeding Bosrons out there for nearly 40 years. Well, is there any, any last words, uh, any, anything you'd like to convey? And... Certainly. Um, most importantly to people interested in the breed, absolutely do your research. And if you get the chance, spend time with some Beaucerons in person. Um, uh, you know, for especially me running the rescue, I'm always open to new people who want to meet the breed. And I'll say, you know, come meet me for a hike or come over and see my dogs play ball in the yard with them for an hour. And sometimes people will throw the ball for the dogs for an hour, and they're like, these dogs aren't tired. I'm like, I know they're not. <laughs> it takes a lot to tire out them. They're like, oh, maybe this isn't the right dog for us. So, you know, do your research ahead of time. Um, certainly, if you are looking for a breeder, we keep a list on the Bowstrong Club's website of breeders who should be following the code of ethics, which is important. And alternatively, if you're looking for a rescue dog, we also keep our rescue dogs on there. So we have we have both, whatever anybody wants, whatever fits in everybody's lifestyle. Um, and ju- again, just keep in mind a good breeder is so important for that temperament, you know, to know what your puppy is going to end up like. Uh, thank you very much, and I um, uh, hope to talk to you someday in the f- near future. Absolutely. You're welcome, Sean.